Okay, um, my name is Kenneth Oy, and I'm with the Center for International Studies and also teach in engineering systems and political science. I'd like to welcome you to the STAR Forum on Japan's continuing nuclear nightmare on Fukushima. And um, before getting into that, there are just a couple announcements and then some introductions uh, to our, for our speakers tonight. The announcement is that coming up on December 12th, there'll be a STAR Forum called Data Collection and the NSA. And that was set up before today's revelations on Germany and uh, wiretapping and cell phone tapping. The people that are gonna be speaking at that forum, and it's gonna be held in the Media Lab from 4.30 to 6 p.m. on that day, it's gonna be moderated by uh, William Fallon, who's the former head of CENTCOM. And the speakers will include Susan Chira from the New York Times, Chaz Freeman, uh, former ambassador to Saudi Arabia, and Joel Brenner, a former senior counsel at the NSA. So you're very much welcome to attend. My suspicion is that topic will not be over by the time that December takes place. Again, December 12th. Uh, this evening, we're talking about something far less controversial and dramatic, Fukushima. Uh, Dick asked me to make it very clear at the outset that the title of tonight's forum, Japan's Continuing Nuclear Nightmare, is not intended to prejudge the issue. But I note that nightmare refers to what? You know, unpleasant dreams from which one typically awakes, or bad or frightening experiences, and that certainly does describe, at least to some extent, what happened at Fukushima and certainly Japan's continuing reaction to it. But our intention tonight is to bring together a group of experts that can be talking about both what's happened what the effects are, the effects on environment and oceans, the effect on politics and on culture, and to do so in a way that might cut through some of the confusion on the issue, to try to get to the bottom of the perceptions of risk, to be assessing damage. And our speakers this evening are actually extraordinarily well qualified to help us in this effort. We're gonna begin with Patrick Stackpole, and Pat, was the chief of staff of US forces Japan during the Fukushima disaster, and was critical in coordinating a number of the release at relief efforts that were taking place. So Pat's gonna lead off with a discussion of what was happening during the first days of the crisis, the first months of the crisis, and the immediate after effects and efforts to address them. We're then gonna turn to Ken Busler. And Ken Busler comes to us from Woods Hole, he made the trip up the Southeast Expressway, for which he deserves enormous credit and thanks. And Ken also is the leader of a project between Woods Hole and the University of Tokyo on assessing the effects of Fukushima on oceans and on the marine environment in the areas around Fukushima. Ken's background for that is that he also led some of the studies on the after effects of Chernobyl and oceans and seas in that area, and is probably the world's leading expert on ocean effects of nuclear disasters and catastrophes. And he'll be presenting on environmental issues. Our final panelist is Dick Samuels, and Dick is the director of the Center for International Studies at MIT. Dick is also someone who's written a book on 311, Disaster and Change in Japan, Cornell University Press. So Dick is gonna be focusing on and talking about the political and cultural after effects, how Japan has responded and reacted. And will also be able to take us into discussion, I think, of some of the foreign policy and international implications. Now I wanna note at the outset that I'm looking forward to this panel enormously, in part because I happen to be in Japan on 311. And I had the embarrassing situation of returning to the US a couple of days after 311 getting off the airplane in Chicago and having these television cameras with floodlights coming up. So they were asking all the passengers getting off the airplane, Fukushima, risk, how are you doing? Are you all right? Are you terrified about your health? 
And of course, all of the Japanese passengers who were in first class and business class were wise enough to say, I don't speak English, sometimes in English, <laughs> and to walk away as quickly as possible from the floodlights. In front of me was a European-American gentleman, about six feet tall, and he was happy to talk with the media. And he was talking about the enormous threats to his health from exposure to the radiation in Tokyo from Fukushima. And going on at length about the courage that he had displayed in remaining in Tokyo. He couldn't leave anyway during that period. Okay. And I'm listening to this with a wry expression on my face. And then, of course, they come up to me. And the microphone comes up, the TV camera's on, and the person says very slowly, are you coming from the airplane from Japan? And the answer is yes. Are you worried about your health after the disaster? And I said, I'm always worried about health, but not particularly worried about my health from a couple days of exposure after Fukushima. And they say, do you understand English? <laughs> and I said, reasonably well. <laughs> and they say, what do you mean? And I say, the direction of the prevailing winds, the monitoring of radiation levels in Tokyo at the time. Uh, also, frankly, even if radiation levels were elevated in Tokyo and they were not at that time, a couple of days of exposure would be not all that significant. And they said, no, no, don't you understand? Disaster, Fukushima. Aren't you worried? And I said, I'm worried about the long-term effects. I'm worried about the broader environmental consequences. But as to my own personal health, I am not. And they kind of look at me with pity and say, what do you do? And I said, I, I, I teach at a technical institution in the Boston area. <laughs> and they said, you're visiting Boston. So I said, no, I teach at MIT. Suddenly, these other cameras come over. <laughs> and then the headline is, MIT professor says no danger from Fukushima. <laughs> Well, let's strike a balance, okay. In fact, I wasn't worried about my health. The long-term consequences were actually fairly complex and worth examining, and we're gonna go with our panel. First Patrick, then Ken Busler, and then Dick Samuels. Thank you for your attention. I'll just go from here, is that okay? You can speak here or up there. Okay. Well, thank you uh, very much, Ken. It's great to be back here. I was here in uh, 2004. Uh, and it's great to see Dick again and one of my old mentors, Harvey, out there. So I appreciate uh, being able to come back. My job during um, Operation Tomodachi 311 uh, aftermath was the chief of staff of U.S. Forces Japan. And U.S. Forces Japan is basically a political military headquarters. Our job was to manage the alliance and to ensure that we had the um, capability to host U.S. forces there for projection throughout Asia. So very little operational uh, um, Wherewithal, you know, guys who receive orders, give orders, uh, take reports, uh, can sense the battlefield and, and be able to bring that information in because we just didn't need it. A lot of political guys, a lot of people with, uh, with uh, language skills and a lot of logistics because that's pretty much what we did. So that was our headquarters. Where I was, I was about uh, four months out from retirement and I was on leave in downtown Shibuya. And I think a lot of people here have been in Shibuya. I was meeting a guy, I was on the first day of leave, they give you 30 days leave to go find a job after 30 years in the army. So I'm on day one, I'm downtown Shibuya, and I'm kind of having a job interview with this, uh, with this guy, and uh, it was a bad day. I didn't get the job, and he stuck me with the bill. So I'm at the cash register paying when all of a sudden, you know, 9.0 earthquake hits. And that building starts whipping, and they run us all out into the, uh, the street, and you guys have been in Shibuya. I'm in the street with 500,000 of my closest friends, you know, like this. And the uh, buildings are going, and the cranes that uh, do construction are going like at 45 degree angles. And, and all those signs that are on all the buildings, all telling you how many bars are in each building, those are flinging back and forth. And I was pretty much sure that, that one of them was going to go down, and everyone's going to be squashed. Well, we survived that. Um, but then, as soon as that was over, everything kind of ceased. Everything closed, the trains closed, the, the taxis stopped, the traffic stopped, buses stopped, cell phones, you couldn't make a call. 
and it was like civilization kind of ended. Well, I knew exactly one way to get back to Yokota Air Base, and that was with the train. And when the train was closed, then I was, I was kind of uh, on my own. So in the next uh, 12 hours or so, barring about two hours sleep in a, in a homeless shelter in Shinjuku, you know, we pretty, I pretty much walked my way west and kind of finally got a train and got back to Yokota Air Base. Walk into my headquarters, and we would had everyone gathered there because obviously, you know, we were, uh, you know, had to get everyone together to start receiving reports from all of our troops throughout uh, throughout Japan. And my uh, operations officer comes up to me, and says, "Hey, Chief, um, PACOM just called. Pacific Command's our higher our higher headquarters, and uh, we have the operational mission of handling humanitarian assistance in Japan." I just finished telling you we didn't have the people to do the operational mission, but tag, you're it. So we, we took the mission, um, you know, as we should. We had the expertise in Japan and, uh, and started working. And uh, my boss, uh, Lieutenant General Field, Air Force uh, Lieutenant General, um, probably is the unsung hero of the whole operation because he, uh, he did everything with absolutely uh, total uh, confidence, but he asked for no credit for himself through it, throughout it all. And he basically said, gave us one thing of guidance. Our job is to save Japanese lives. We got a very narrow window to help the wounded and to uh, do the search and rescue. And that's what we're going to focus on. And what we were going to focus on was making sure that uh, Washington and, uh, and, and uh, Pacific Command had updates every 10 seconds. So with my very small staff, that's what we focused on. We focused on, on the mission. Well, um, after about. Um, by lunch, I think, the magnitude of the, um, of the problem just got bigger and bigger and bigger. Every time we got a report, it was more damage, more people gone, more people missing. It, just, it, was, it was just um, exponential. Then around lunchtime, uh, my J2, my intelligence officer, comes in. He goes, uh, Chief, hey, we got a problem. You know, it was kind of one of those Houston, we got a problem things. He said, the nuclear facilities, Fukushima, you know, we don't know, but we think something's happening. That was about the amount of, of information we had. And I went nuclear. We had nobody that could spell nuclear. We had nobody that knew anything about it, you know? And so we were at the, at the infancy of trying to gather information. Well, of course, once that started, the, uh, the huge staffs that are in the Joint Staff in Washington and, and in Pacific Command have an ex just an incredible appetite for information. And so they are dragging it. They're hitting us all the time with just incredible amounts of, of information gathering, which as I told you before, we did not have the people to do that. So we focused on the mission, and we were not making PACOM happy. So they, they put up with that for about three days. And then they, sent, uh, they said, guess what? We're going to help you out. We're going to send Admiral Walsh and a standing joint task force 519 out of PACOM is going to come take over the mission. And uh, we all thought we were fired. You know, we'd been working for five, four or five days, working almost 24-7, and um, now they're going to bring in someone else to do this mission. But it actually worked out pretty well. These guys were operational experts, highly trained, and worked with PACOM all the time. And as soon as they uh, showed up, they basically said, hey, we'll handle the, all the communication with PACOM and with the joint staff. You guys handle the mission in Japan because you get the expertise. And that's how we divided up the, the operation. And Admiral Walsh is, again, he's, he's in all the... All the books, but he did a super job in, in order to make sure that we got the, the mission accomplished. And he brought in a ton of nuclear experts that really helped us understand the problem. And the biggest problem with all the nuke uh, stuff in the beginning was nobody knew the answer. Um, I mean, TEPCO didn't know everything. The instruments that worked, some of them were wrong, some of them didn't work. I mean, it was just it was just impossible to really quantify the problem in those early days. And, uh, and that was an issue, um, because the second part of this was our partner, the U.S. Embassy, with Ambassador Roos, who, uh, uh, who did a phenomenal job and was, was at the helm the whole time, coordinated directly with USFJ throughout the whole thing. But he's trying to understand, well, what are we doing as far as evacuation, or do we need to evacuate? And trying to understand the, the magnitude of the problem and what the future should be. And, uh, but he did a great job and was working uh, lockstep with us as we went, went forward on that. The, uh, Japanese, uh, um, the Japanese government, you know, we were very, USFJ, again, we're Paul Mill headquarters. We had the highest contacts with the Japanese government. We dealt with them on, on a daily basis. A couple of things that, that really happened right off the bat was the, they were stunned 
they were stunned by the magnitude of the problem. Um, I mean, it was 250,000 homeless, you know, 25,000, and at that point, it just kept going up every day, 25,000, you know, dead. It was just it, stunned by the magnitude of the problem. But they're also stunned by the whole nuclear thing. One, the, the world, you know, instead of giving them sympathy, or they gave them a little sympathy, but then the next question was, hey, what are you doing about all these uh, stray electrons that are flying around? And so they were stunned with that because they didn't know the answer and we're, they were trying to do it like everyone else. And then finally, there was a, a lot of people and I was, uh, I was at the Japanese embassy last Thursday, talked to Ambassador Sase, and there was a lot of people that thought Japan was ruined. You know, it was that level of, you know, this, it's over, you know, and, uh, and it caused almost a malaise, uh, you know, throughout the, the, J the Japanese government. So I'd just like to give you, so what did America do to help that? And, um, and that's one thing I think we can be very proud of, of what, uh, what we did early on, is the Americans, the American forces, uh, and, and, the, uh, and the embassy, we were there from day one. And we weren't going anywhere. You know? And no troop left, uh, left Japan. We stayed with them. We we've worked side by side with the Japanese forces from day one. Anything they needed, we jumped on it to make things happen. And then uh, three... We'd been at war for 10 years. We were kind of men and women of action, and we were used to chaos and a, and a, and a crisis action mode of, by training and experience over the last 10 years. And so we just went out and did stuff. And I'd like to give you an anecdote. The um, first time I went up into the, uh, into the disaster area I was up in Sendai. And I went with General Oriki, um, and he was basically, or he is the, the Japanese version, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Uh, a tremendous gentleman, a great leader, a great officer. Um, I mean, I, I was proud to, to serve with him. And um, so he uh, offered to, to take me up there with his helicopter, me and a few other, few other guys. And so we're flying up there as we bypass uh, Fukushima number two, plant three, it exploded. We weren't too close, but you know, it gets your attention when people in white suits have Geiger counters when you, when you get off the plane. Um, you know, so it was really early on, it was about the third day. And we go up to Sendai Airport, and Sendai Airport was basically underwater. And if you've ever been, well, you've been to your airports or seen floods, that everything around an airport floats. Those parking lots, the cars all float. All those boxes you put your baggage in, that all floats. Everything floats. That airport was just scattered with tons of crap all over that thing. I flew over it, and I said, they're never going to get this thing open. It's going to be years. We fly down to the end, and there's Japanese air base, F-16s coming out of second-story windows like lawn darts. I mean, the devastation was amazing. And you fly along the coast for an hour, and it's nothing three kilometers in from the coast. Everything's gone. You know, the devastation was, was absolutely amazing. So we get back from that flight after they decontaminated us, and, uh, and um, a couple of, um, one of the Marine commanders and one of the Army commanders says, hey, we want to try and go get Sendai Airport open. And we'd just been there, and we're like, are you kidding me? And um, you know, to General Field's credit, my commander, he says, hey, if you want to try, let her rip. And we sent up basically a company of, of Army soldiers, about a little less than a company of Marines, a bunch of forklifts and some trucks. And um, next thing I know, they're telling me they're landing C-130s at the Sendai Airport. And, uh, and I'm like, you can't, I couldn't believe it. And that was like two days later. Three days later, I flew in there with a the PACOM commander, Admiral Willard, and he's got a Pretty nice 737 tricked out as his, his personal airplane. We landed that on Sendai Airport. And when you landed on Sendai Airport, all you saw was a mountain of cars and a mountain of garbage. And these soldiers and Marines that you know, hadn't slept in about a week and just were forklifting things and moving stuff and, and making it happen. And I'll tell you what, the Japanese that were with them, they saw that and they were making it happen too. And the mayor of Sendai was there and he said, hey, I'm gonna open this airport and we're gonna open it in 30 days to commercial traffic. And he made it happen. And, and on that trip, you know, it's another anecdote because we drove off the, uh, this is day seven. We drove off the, uh, the airport. The only road that uh, gets to the airport is the elevated highway. And as we pull up the highway, we stopped and I looked out and I wondered why we stopped. Well, they were manning the toll booth. This is day seven. Devastation as far as you can see, both directions. But that toll booth was manned. And that's why I kind of said, you know, maybe this thing will be okay. You know, maybe we'll, we'll get there. 
So then we drive off the, um, down into downtown Sendai. And Sendai, about half of it's flooded out and half of it was fine. So we're going through the, the flooded out piece. And um, we're probably five kilometers from the coast. And we had to stop again to divert around a ship. And I'm not talking a boat. I'm talking a ship. And we have to drive around like a block to get by. And as we're driving around, I see this old guy sitting out in front of his bowling alley. And he's got a mountain of bowling pins and a mountain of bowling balls, and he's wiping them off one at a time. And I'm like, you know, I think we'll probably do okay there too. And they had a, they had a long way to go, but uh, once, the, once the Japanese got going, it was amazing what they accomplished. Um, the Japanese military was incredible. Uh, they basically went to the field and lived in tents for six months. Their sensitivity dealing with casualties, their sensitivity dealing with people that were, were homeless. They, not only they were homeless, you know, several generations of graves, of family, of, um, you know, homes, all that stuff was out to sea. They were just emotionally devastated. And the sensitivity they used to, that, that, that um, they dealt with their people was just uh, absolutely incredible. So, you know, I would just say the takeaways I took from the thing was... Um, the U.S.-Japanese alliance, um, I, I, you know, it was, it's 10 times stronger than it was when I got to Japan in 2008, without a doubt. And I've gone to the Japanese embassy probably every six months to something in the last two years. And to this day, uh, the Japanese ambassador always gets up and, and thanks America in a rather gushing way for, for what we did uh, for the operation and uh, to help them. And, you know, it really wasn't that much in the totality of the operation, but it was on day one. And we were not leaving. That They were our, they were our ally, and we're going to be there to see them through this whole thing. And the second takeaway is the Japanese military, their self-defense force. You know, in a lot of ways, the, um, they kept a very low profile, you know, in Japan. They, and they, they, their profile raised big time. And the Japanese people, I think, got a lot more respect and a lot more credibility. The stock of the Japanese Self-Defense Force went up a lot. And I think that's going to help uh, our alliance and the security in Asia as we go to the future. So. Overseas populations, uh, Japanese Americans, were contributing uh, to that effort. In fact, this event is co-sponsored by the Japanese American Citizens League. Uh, but I think Pat's presentation rightly places emphasis on the resilience of Japan and the Japanese forces and people at the individual level in reacting to and responding to what was a horrible situation. We now turn to a lighter note. Fukushima. And Ken Busler will be talking about Fukushima view from the ocean, but looking to a set of issues that we're worried about even now, and as you know, the reports of radiation leaks of water spilling into the ocean uh, continue to this day. And to bring clarity to this situation, Ken. Thank you, Ken. Uh, very pleased to be here, and as kind of a, again, a different view, and partly because of my background, I'm going to show you some graphs, some numbers, so I'm going to use slides. And these relate to the human stories, but this is about what you see when you go on the ocean and start looking for what the radioactive releases are. I should say first, uh, I'm from the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. We're on Cape Cod, depending on traffic, a couple hours from here. Uh, we're a non-for-profit, about 850 people. We have a PhD program with MIT, but we're independent. Uh, we typically get funding from our government for doing various research projects. In this case, we went to private sources. We didn't have time to write grants and wait three years to get funding. We were in Yokohama Harbor here uh, in early June, late May, on a research ship with 17 scientists, 13 institutions, uh, thanks to a grant from the Moore Foundation. This was not typical ocean sciences. This was a very quick and deliberate response that we had when we started to see the results I'll show you of the levels in the ocean having concern and wanted to get there as soon as we could to evaluate the circumstances. Because as you imagine what you're hearing on land, people were concerned about health and safety. We were looking kind of more farther afield into the ocean, where this was going, how that would affect the larger picture. 
So that required us to get there with our own ship early on uh, and find private sources to do that. Quickly, my background a bit, I have done work since Chernobyl, so we kind of knew what we had to do, but we hadn't done this in many years. 25 years is a long time, and there aren't many people left from that era of scientific study, so I had to really look around to find people who could measure different isotopes in the ocean. Uh, this is last month, September. We're a little closer this time. This is the Daiichi plant in the background and a Japanese ship, Daisan Kayu Maru, and we're now participating with Japanese scientists on their research and getting as close as one kilometer. We have no restrictions on where we can sample uh, outside of one kilometer uh, at this time uh, in Japan. So we're getting great access and I think a quite interesting perspective that I'll talk about. First, uh, your lesson is about cesium. I'll focus primarily on cesium isotopes. Uh, the primary source is when we made these man-made isotopes in the weapon testing area in the 60s. To this day, that's the largest source. It is a radio nuclear of concern. Some of the iodine, the isotopes of health concern to humans decayed quite quickly after the accident. This is around for, well, as you'll see, 30 years or two years, depending on which isotope you're talking about. And I think the only thing here to really focus on is that with two isotopes from cesium, one with a half-life of two years, <clears throat> means every two years, half of it decays. There's not anything left from the earlier inputs from the 60s of Chernobyl. So we could fingerprint exactly where our cesium had come from. We knew right away if it came from Fukushima or some prior source by that isotope ratio. That's a very useful thing as a scientist. So what were the sources? I'll go through four and then I'll show you data behind this cartoon. Basically, we had the explosive releases from the reactors to the atmosphere of radionuclides. They were deposited on land and in the ocean. So in the oceans, that view meant that we would, uh, without measurement, expect that with rain and with fallout, both wet and dry, we would have deposition there. Now, if you're trying to map this out, you basically take wind charts. You look at the direction of the winds, and you try and predict. It's about 80% of the radioactivity that was released to the atmosphere, and those explosive releases that you saw fell on the ocean. And that's actually really good news for Japan. You know, this is constant or pretty regular winds offshore. Had they blown further inshore, it would have flipped this around. Exposure would have been much higher. So this is a fortunate consequence of this, the sighting of this. But it's also right on the ocean. So for the oceans, they also, well, well, I guess we could predict this, but the consequence of this accident is different than things like Chernobyl, is that we had direct discharge. We had a reactors that had to be kept cool. The firefighters were doing heroic jobs, the people on plant to kind of put water on these as quick as they could because they had lost all cooling. That's the cause of the explosion, the overheating, the eventual meltdown and melt throughs. But when you're doing that, you're putting water, first salt water, then fresh water on reactors. They're leaking, the basements are filling up, there's groundwater, all mixing and directly discharging. And I'll show you data suggests that that actually came later, the peak of radioactivity, than the March, shortly after the March 11th accident. And I'll also show you a little bit later that when you have fallout on land, you're going to expect stuff coming down the river, so there's a small and continuous input. And we're going to hear in the news, and we're going to talk a little about that groundwater flow, both at the reactor site that's now kind of like a contaminated site because of all the local releases, and further away, we are going to have groundwater inputs to this type of coastal system. So the first question, how big was it? How does it compare? That was asked early on. Uh, I've got three major events here, Fukushima at the top, Sellafield, and I'll talk about that last, and Chernobyl, we'll start down here. And with a bar, and the blue lines meaning what went into the ocean, and the scale of the bar telling us how much cesium was released in units of Becquerels. I'll stick mostly with, Bec well, I think only with Becquerels. That's a decay event per second. Uh, this is a lot of Becquerels, 10 to the 15th, the one with 15 zeros. This audience should know all this. I'll talk later about Terra Becquerels, a thousand times smaller. But about 85, and it's mostly in the land side of that, not on the ocean side. Of course, that makes sense. Chernobyl is hundreds and hundreds, well, about three to 500 kilometers from the oceans, the North Sea, Baltic Seas, north of that, the Black Sea that I studied to the south. So this was a land-based event in terms of the release of the isotopes. Fukushima, you'll see mostly blue. You also see different lengths of those bars, because to this day, since most of that fallout went into the ocean, we didn't really get to the ocean quick enough and do enough sampling. 
we really don't know the scale of this, but it's something like at the lower end, about 14, at the high end, about 70 petabecquerels of cesium from that accident. But it is quite different in its nature in terms of the contamination is dominated by the ocean releases, not by the land releases. They're also quite different, and we can get into questions about the type of accident, the radioactive isotopes themselves. Uh, but I would say one thing is we don't have a good handle on that. We may never get that. But these are kind of similar scale in terms of the two largest accidental releases, sources of radionuclides. Sellafield, we often forget about. Uh, there's a reprocessing facility in the UK, uh, formerly called Windscale, until they had a fire and an accident there and changed the name. Maybe a smart thing to do, but basically, if you add up their discharge into the Irish Sea between England and Ireland, it adds up to about 41 petabecquerels of cesium-137. That's also similar. That was intentional. They've stopped doing that for reasons of health and safety, but the annual discharges in the 70s are up to five petabecquerels. So we have examples to look to to see what the consequences are. What's the Irish Sea like today? It's not the same ocean, but we've done this on purpose. Uh, we scale for weapons testing is about 800 of these units, by the way. So I kind of look at these and say these are similar in scale, and we could argue about which one's bigger. It was politically impossible, the first paper I wrote, for Japanese scientists to be co-authored because I compared Fukushima to Chernobyl, and that was considered not appropriate by his bosses at his institution. Uh, okay, what's happened in the ocean? Now we're gonna start right at the reactor. There's Fukushima Daiichi on the coast of Japan. The red dots are just outside that harbor. Samples taken by TEPCO and started to be report, reported to the media, and people would call me up and say, what does it mean? There's a dot here, there's a level of 1,000 or 10,000. Now becquerels per cubic meter, a big volume of water. It's a ton of water. And we're using this unit here because prior to the accident, that number was about one and a half to two. That's what I had studied. That's what we measure around the ocean. Here in the Atlantic, it's about two. This is a timeline from early on to about one year later. This is what we published using TEPCO's data to point out that a couple of features here. You see it going up. This is 50 million becquerels per cubic meter. I had studied Chernobyl. We had never seen things above about 1,000 in the ocean. So this is what we called an unprecedented accident. When the health physics people started looking at this, they said, yeah, this is of concern. When you're up here, you might have mortality effects directly on organisms living in the ocean. Now, the good news is that this really went down quickly. What this was is an increase and decrease of water that was built up in those basements and the turbine buildings flowing into the ocean, sort of like the Gulf oil spill. There were pictures in the newspaper of like a fire hose of radioactive water going into the ocean. They plugged up that leak and cesium, sure enough, started to decrease quite quickly. What happens and why? It's because you put an isotope that's soluble that moves with all of these ocean currents and it's gonna decrease in concentration. There's a lot of water here flowing offshore and alongshore that's gonna decrease your source. And that's what happened during those first few days. So fortunately, we were able to, the Japanese, through their heroic efforts on site, plug the leaks, slow this decrease down. Now this half-life is 30 years. This isn't radioactive decay. This is a 10,000 times decrease because of ocean mixing. But then it actually started to level off a bit. And to this day, we're out at about 1,000, the numbers I saw most recently last week. And we haven't closed this off. It would actually continue down here if you simply put this in the uh, ocean and stopped the source. So we've been saying for about two years that there's a continuous source, much smaller. And let's put that in context of regulation limits. Japanese were saying, well, they didn't have any leaks. I think they were looking at their regulatory limits. You're allowed to put about uh, 60,000 becquerels per cubic meter in the ocean by their regulation. Uh, this is our drinking water limit. In Japan, it's about 10,000. That's what you're allowed to drink. I put a banana on the scale here. These are relatively similar to the natural radionuclides in the ocean, potassium-40. So while they're elevated, those levels are no longer of concern when I was out there in June for my direct exposure, but we'll move on later to seafood and when you consume the isotopes, what that means for your internal dose, and that is still of concern today. But we rapidly approached levels, even at the reactor site, that were no longer of concern for just being there. Simply being in that first picture close to the reactor doesn't mean I'm in harm's way in terms of my exposure from cesium in the ocean and the other isotopes. That's important to keep in mind. 
where does it go? We're going to see some, I could do this as a movie, but to save some time. Uh, this is Japan, this is Fukushima, and these little arrows are the location and strength of the current called the Kurishio. We like to call it the Gulf Stream of the Pacific because we're more familiar often with the Gulf Stream. Very fast moving current, moves like a little snake offshore, and when you release a contaminant that's soluble, it's going to move with those currents as fast as 1,500 kilometers here in one month. This is a prediction from a Japanese model. Several groups were doing this early on, as you can imagine. You know, the health and safety of the people working there depended upon maps like this of where you'd want to put your ships. Uh, we were out sampling some of these features and trying to map out what the consequences were for the ocean. I'll also note, forget about the units, but the scale here goes from 10 to 0 0.001, you know, four orders of magnitude plus of dilution already, a thousand kilometers offshore. We expect the concentration to decrease just like they did onshore as we get further offshore. There's no way that that wouldn't happen despite what you might read. Uh, and there's also the consequence of having this fast current means it stays kind of to the north. And so places down here, people ask me about Guam. We had samples from Guam. We didn't see the isotopes there. It's primarily confined to this region. Okay, let's go a little further. We're living on the East Coast, but if you're on the West Coast, I keep getting asked, well, when's it going to reach there? This is a model prediction. There's April 2012, 2014. We keep changing color scales, even though the concentrations are getting lower. So bright red here only means something like a couple hundred of becquerels in April and 2012 and 14. This is on the surface ocean. Here's Japan. Here's the US West Coast. There's Hawaii, actually. So what's going to happen is this stuff will move across with the ocean currents. It's going to arrive after the debris. If you're a soccer ball or something, a dock on the surface, you get blown by the wind as well as pushed by the currents. So debris came here much earlier than when we expect the arrival to be on the West Coast, which is right about now and into next year. How much and more detail on that? Well, there's a graph here. And I'm picking on this particular paper because it's the most recent. There have been only two or three, actually. You won't be able to see all these numbers, but the highest number is 30 becquerels per cubic meter. Remember, we had a peak at the, you know, 50 million. Then it dropped down to 10,000. Uh, the predictions vary from one or two, actually, to 30. This is the highest number I've ever seen in the model. And when people say, well, why aren't we monitoring? It's because that number is so low, we think it's not of human health concern. On the other hand, I still think we should be modeling to at least say where we're going to be on this. And you'll see there's a little bit of a delay in these different locations, Seattle here, San Diego, Hawaii later, in the concentrations, but based on uh, pretty crude models still and very little data. But it's something that we're looking into by doing some opportunistic sampling on the US West Coast, convince ourselves that this is actually true. But it can't be much higher than 30. Let's go back to Japan. And look at a few more things in slides. Here's a map showing the Daiichi plant here. And then circles scaling to the size, the amount of cesium. This is a maximum. The biggest one there is 45 becquerels per cubic meter. We're down now in the 50 range. But it's still there. So you know anything coming out of the news this summer, and I was quoted saying it's silly to think it's not getting out of the harbor. It's getting out of the harbor. It's measurable. It might not be of human health concern directly, but it's there along the coast. It's highest near that nuclear power plant, and the water is coming from it. Uh, last month, we were there. Our highest number today is 150. Whether it's because we got closer or because it's actually increasing, I can't tell you tonight. But I have seen some of the highest numbers in the TEPCO data in the last month at the coast recently of about one or 2,000 becquerels for cesium. And we'll move on to other isotopes, too. But that's really the situation today. So let's look at that situation more like a box, like what's happening offshore, where'd it go? So you look at a 200 meter, 600 foot water depth, take a slice north and south of Fukushima. What might surprise you, because I said cesium moves with the currents, there's seafloor there. Well, a small fraction, 0.1%, does end up with clays or with the organism settling to the seafloor. That's why we had to switch to terabecquerels, a thousand times lower unit. There's 100 in the seafloor, only 15 in the ocean in that box. So there's more cesium associated with the sediments that are accumulating today off Japan than the stuff that's leaking out and moving quickly with the currents. That's the change. That's new. The rivers, very few data when I get to these types of arrows, but 
something in that same unit of a terabecquerel of about one when you add up the waterborne and the sediment coming down, the rivers of a becquerel coming down. Uh, there's a number that the Japanese published well over uh, but about eight months ago. They're talking about 12 months ago, uh, released that number and published it. Uh, there was news this summer about the leaks. Was it getting into the ocean? We had said two years ago it was getting in the ocean. The Japanese published these numbers, 0.3. You could say that's big or small, but to, it's about the same magnitude of what's coming down the rivers, and it's something that is not under their control. It's the groundwater, it's the tanks, and that's just for the isotope of cesium-137 at the site. I use this, and I'll go one more slide, to look at also what's getting out of the system along the bottom. That's not a big number either. We have very few numbers, studies of that, but as an oceanographer, when people say, well, how long will it stay contaminated? I tell people, well, there's one or so terabecquerels coming in each month, and maybe that much getting offshore, that seafloor is going to remain contaminated for decades to come. The half-life of cesium-137 is 30 years. That's what's going to determine the long-term fate on the coast of Japan today. So let's uh, summarize some numbers and, and bring up one new isotope, strontium-90. We saw 0.3 terabecquerels being released per month today. At the peak, when they were plugging that hole, that number was tens of thousands. It's nothing like what was going on two and a half years ago for this isotope. These numbers get a little bit closer. Strontium was a very small component of the releases. It didn't come out with the explosion. It did come out with the discharge. 30-year half-life as well. And now we're talking about something that's bone-seeking, a different type of behavior in our system, so different health effects if it gets into our systems. Those numbers are closer to each other, but what's actually more interesting is at the power plant today, they removed the cesium isotopes from the cooling water stream, the 30, I'm sorry, 300 tons that you hear about. They have tanks that are the waste waiting to be decontaminated from the other isotopes like strontium and tritium. So what happens now, you're going to release sources that are strontium rich and things like a tank each tank, 300 ton leaks, uh, maybe a month ago now, would have the equivalent of 12 of these terabacquerels that went into the ground that go into the ocean. Any oceanographer, any groundwater hydrologist tell you if you put it in the ground near the ocean, it's going to go into the ocean. It's flowing downstream. Uh, the wells that they sunk near the reactors go up and down with the tides. So those 12 terabacquerels, I can't tell you if it's going to take days or months or years, but are going to make their way into the ocean. Ten of those tanks would equal the entire amount released two and a half years ago for strontium-90. So we have a potential with 1,000 tanks until they're cleaned up to have huge additional inputs of things like strontium-90. That hasn't happened yet, but I'm not concerned about the cesium as much as I am strontium-90, and that's why uh, to this day. So I'll move to fish, kind of rapidly touching lots of topics. Everyone asked me about this. It's a cute little diagram from the Japanese fisheries, the big-eyed, smiling fish. With cesium isotopes going in and out quite quickly, both the unradioactive and the reactive forms, just like salt, a tubule is sort of like Gatorade. It's something that goes in and out of you uh, as you and as fish take up and drink and eat uh, isotopes of cesium with something like a 50-day half-life biologically. Uh, another way to look at it for a public audience is to say, you know, if you took a contaminated tuna, put it in a can, it's going to take 30 years to lose half the cesium in that can of tuna because of its radioactive decay. You take a fish that's contaminated and put it in clean water, it'll lose half the cesium in 50 days because it pushes out those salts, it pushes out cesium. It doesn't bioaccumulate in huge degree. It goes through the fish quite fast. So knowing this, let's look at the fish. And this is my only fish slide. I'm not a fishery scientist, but a lot of data is coming out of Japan without interpretation. This is some of it that I took uh, last year about this time, and published the results of cesium becquerels per kilogram of the wet weight of the fish. W each one is uh, 1, 10, 100,000, 10,000 at the top. How much cesium is in those fish on a given day in 2011 and 12? And sorted here by where they're the most contaminated. There's over 10,000 points on here. And you can see right away that the numbers are generally higher, closest to the reactor another sign of a source. Uh, the dashed line on each one is 100 becquerels, which is a limit in Japan for food and seafood for cesium. This is why they have kept fisheries closed. These are bottom fish in particular, which have the highest level, so I'm picking on the worst case here. 
Uh, with a log scale, you can't see the slight decrease, but it's nowhere near 50 days had they stopped the sources at the reactors. This is a, a billion dollar kind of economic problem. It's a cultural loss when you want to eat your local seafood like we all do and appreciate uh, for its good health benefits and other things. So to this day, they've just started to reopen on a test basis some fisheries off Fukushima, but it's the bottom fish closest to the reactors. I've seen numbers up 10, 20, 50,000 for individual fish. We shouldn't be worried as a, a population of eating a meal up here, but they draw this line looking at sustained risk of eating contaminated fish, therefore keep them off the market because of this risk. And therefore, in Japan and in our country, we're not eating those fish. I go to Japan, I eat the fish. In this country, fish from Japan are not coming from this area. So they're monitoring, they're doing a good job, but they're having a hard time saying, when will it be safe? So some lessons and then a couple more things after this. It's unprecedented in terms of the amount that was released to the ocean. We study this for lots of reasons, first, foremost, human health, but also future accidents. And Japan, I have to say, does lead the oceanographic study of their uh, consequence of this. But by coming in independently, we can build confidence into comparing our data. And we increase, as a scientist, the number of data points, which is important. Uh, it still leaks radionuclides into the ocean, that site, those power plants, those tanks. My concern is strontium-90, which is left behind in those tanks. They haven't yet come up with a way to process that water quick enough. Studies of fish are not enough, and I'll go on and talk about the communications a little bit here to end the slides about motivation, what we should be doing to help inform people, because there's certainly an interest and an anxiety every time there's a news, and it seems to be happening at least once a week. I get phone calls from all these different news agencies. What does it mean? You know, how safe is it? How does today's release compare to other sites? And we try and interpret that in a way that is actually you know, trusted and independent of the people who are responsible for the cleanup or the company, TEPCO, that you could say is responsible for the problem or the reactor in the first place. And we try and serve that in different ways. And one way we're doing that is through organizing a center called the Center for Marine and Vital Mental Radioactivity. That's in Woods Hole. We're trying to work on the public outreach. What does radiation mean? How dangerous is it when you talk about alpha, beta, gamma radiation? Much more than we have time to go into today. Educating new, I say kids, I'm getting old enough now. And we're trying to do things like have open meetings. Uh, later on, if you came in early, you probably didn't see this. But it's an issue of a magazine produced by my institution called Oceanus. And if you open it up and you, you're confused, it's because you look at the Japanese side or not the English side. But it's printed in two languages by taking science writers to this type of meeting or actually science conferences, saying, get the story right and try and tell people what are the simple lessons about how we communicate disasters, what are the economic consequences, how do isotopes behave in seafood, uh, why are certain areas closed and not others. And so we're in the process of looking for supporters to keep that going as one example. And then my la very last thing and, uh, is basically this type of quote, what's needed next? You know, there was an editorial in Nature that I really appreciate. It really timed well with a trip I was taking in September to Japan because we've been trying to do this on our own for now two and a half years. And we really need this international alliance. We've seen the value of working with the Japanese, the Europeans, US, putting our force together to study the oceans. Now, that really will help, but we haven't been invited in. We haven't been kept out. We got permission to sample in record time. Six weeks from when I got funded, I was there with the ship. They allowed us in. But I think these types of statements are important right now, and maybe they'll come up in the question and answer. When the prime minister says, my country needs your knowledge and expertise, I'm seeing a big change that was not told to us two and a half years ago. In some ways, it was kind of from my field, we have the people, we can take care of it. But on the other hand, I think we saw in the process of just being insistent and going that we actually built a cadre of colleagues that we can work with and build public confidence. Uh, I don't think that this actually has gone as far as beyond the cleanup. The people they're bringing in now are ex-DOE officials, people from Nuclear Regulatory Commission in the US to help with the cleanup. That's a huge problem. We'll have, probably have questions about that. But I think we need to continue this kind of assessment in the oceans, because ultimately, you can't keep putting tanks, I'm sorry, contaminated waste in tanks. You're going to have to decontaminate and release some of that water. There's a finite amount of real estate. That's going to take an assessment of what's left in the tank, how much can you release, what are the consequences. 
No one's going to believe TEPCO. There's a shattered trust there. No one's going to believe uh, government labs. We're going to need groups outside to be helping assess that. And I'm even more confused, and maybe our next speaker can address some of these statements that come out, like from Abe, after saying, we need your knowledge, and said, the situation's under control. Well, they, every week, you know, last weekend, there was first the typhoon and rains, and they're not able to control the amount of water in a rain event to stop leakage to the ocean and groundwater of some of these isotopes of concern, now particularly high in strontium-90. I think the press has been fixated on what the worst case scenarios are. All of those tanks leaking, yes, they're pretty bad, but they haven't happened yet. Uh, but when people keep coming out saying it's under control, that really makes it hard to tell the other side, which is not the extreme or an imminent danger, or it's not unsafe to swim off California, but just what we know and how to put that in perspective. And, and this hurts as much as the extreme side that says, you know, we're going to all die, the Pacific will be a dead zone in a few years, and that's also quite harmful. So we're trying to somehow be in the middle and uh, take part in those international investigations. Thank you. Samuels has the challenge of batting cleanup to restore our confidence, to offer decisive analysis of the political and economic uh, implications of these disasters. Dick, can you restore confidence? Um, everything's under control. <laughs> Thanks, Ken. And I also want to thank Tom Blackwood for conspiring with Ken to put this, this meeting together um, uh, from the MIT Japan program. I'm very grateful to Tom and to Ken both. Um, what I'm going to do, uh, if we can pull up uh, my slides, Ken, that would be great. I'm going to speak from uh, the book that, that uh, Professor Oi uh, mentioned. Um, which um, looks at, it, it's two, I was in Japan for a year doing research on uh, the consequences of uh, what's called colloquially 311. Uh, it was March 11th, 2011. That's the book, but um, uh, I'm not here to sell books. But I do want to let you know that what I'm going to talk to you about is a slice out of, out of the book. And, and, it's, and it's organized around an idea about how to think about crises. Because this was, without regard for um, the, the objective measures of uh, the disaster, it, it, subjectively for the Japanese, this was every inch of it was, was an enormous crisis. And uh, when you have crises, um, there are many things. Um, but one of the things above all that they are are instruments for political actors who want to use those crises as a way to uh, further uh, their political ambitions and their political aims. I'm a political scientist. I'm not exactly making an apology for it, but uh, sometimes I need to do that at MIT. Um, these political entrepreneurs r write stories about what the real lessons of the catastrophes, of the catastrophe were. So they're writing these narratives. They're framing the event for people, um, and they're uh, they're they're deciding who the heroes are and they're deciding who the villains are uh, in, in the story um, in order to, as I say, legitimate uh, or delegitimate um, other views to legitimate their own and to sort of shift the balance of, 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 of factors in the direction of their choosing. It's what, it's what individual, ambitious individuals in the political world do. Um, one, one of whom um, is the mayor of Chicago, uh, who, f who famously uh, characterized what I just said in a very academic way, in a very uh, straightforward, uh, prosaic way, which is that you never want to waste a good crisis if you're a political actor. That's Rahm Emanuel. Um, and that's, what, that's really the way in which uh, I think the Japanese uh, political world approached 311, and it's the way I, what's what I tried to capture uh, in the book. Um, the, the, um, there were four basic um, pieces of conversation. In order to understand how this works is you have to understand what, the, what people were talking about and how they were talking about uh, the catastrophe. And they, they really had four fundamental conversations. Um, these are them, uh, leadership, risk, commu uh, community, and uh, change. I'm going to take each in turn. I'm just going to flick at it. I'm going to actually speed up. Um, um, and I'm going to focus more on change here. Um, than on the others, but just to, to sort of give you a, a picture of what the national conversation looked like. Let's say one other thing about political leaders, political entrepreneurs. These folks, none of them changed. They were the most striking, the most striking thing for me was that not a single one, well, only one, changed his or her mind about uh, anything 
in the, in the context of the crisis. That is, Prime Minister Khan, who became a major villain. I'll, I'll talk about the villainous Prime Minister Khan. I'm, I'm being ironic here. Um, but Prime Minister Khan went from being pro-nuclear to anti-nuclear. Everyone else who told stories about 311, who wrote narratives about it, was, was basically using it to affirm and sell uh, pre-existing preferences in the political arena. OK, so leadership. Uh, let's start with that. Um, there were very few Japanese satisfied with the quality of their political leadership um, uh, in, the, in the aftermath of 311. Um, Prime Minister Khan <clears throat> became the villain in chief, and it didn't matter that the, the villainous activities that, he was, uh, that were ascribed to him, attributed to him, I should say, um, were all, almost always contradictory. Either he was micromanaging or he was too detached. He was acting too quickly, he was acting too slowly. He relied on bureaucrats, he didn't trust the bureau. It didn't matter. The fact is that the public accepted uh, every version uh, of, of uh, seemed to, by public opinion polls, accept every version of the critiques and uh, the critiques were relentless. And when he left, um, uh, he, his departure wasn't, wasn't mourned. Uh, this is, this is a country in which the notion of political leadership is, or Japanese leadership sort of has this oxymoronic quality and had an oxymoronic quality before 311. People are always talking about their leadership deficit and bemoaning it. Um, nonetheless, um, this was an opportunity to really demonstrate um, the problem of leadership and, and he, he passed that test in the public mind. On um, the issue of risk, which is, which is um, a large part of, of why we're here um, today. Uh, it's a reminder that the idea of Japan being vulnerable in a hostile world is really very central to Japanese uh, national identity, Japanese thinking about the world. It's in Japanese, we talk about the Shimaguniro, and we're a small island trading nation, precariously dependent upon imported raw materials cut adrift in a hostile world. It's one word, right? It's one word. And, and, but what happens is almost everything about Japan is explained by one or another piece of that long idea. Um, so it's no surprise, and it shouldn't have been a surprise, that threat uh, and, and, and vulnerability and risk became a really leading element of the national discourse um, uh, after, after 311. Because anticipation of future danger, as, as Ken said, as, as anticipation of future danger was everywhere. People just didn't know how bad was this going to be. Well, let's, let's figure it's going to be as, as bad as it can be. And that's, uh, that really was, an agitate, uh, was, was, was agitated and provoked uh, all sorts of concern. On the six-month anniversary, I was in Japan, the six-month anniversary of the event, I, I put into a Japanese Google search the Japanese word for safety and security and the, and the date, 311, the, 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 the word that described the, the, the catastrophe, and I got 524 million hits. This was what people were, ta people were talking about leadership. They were talking about um, risk. What's interesting is the word that was used to describe risk in Japanese, because there's a perfectly normal word used to describe risk in Japanese, and it's an English, it's a word borrowed from English. Risku. Risku. And um, that's not the word, I mean, that was used. But that wasn't the word that was used most often. The word that was used most often can't be translated as risk, but it evoked the same set of, uh, same set of concerns. It's a little bit more oblique, but the word in Japanese is solteigai, beyond imagination. It was, it was something we couldn't have imagined. It's an important word. Um, it's a very important word because, um, because it, was, it was used by the government, and particularly by TEPCO, um, as an excuse, really, uh, for, or at least let me try it differently, as an explanation for their failure to anticipate and prepare for a 311 scale uh, uh, catastrophe. Um, and it began to dominate the national discourse. Either you believed it was truly Sotegai, and therefore, you know, it was a, not a man-made disaster, it was a natural disaster, and, or uh, you believed it was, uh, and it was a black swan event, it's gonna happen only once every thousand years, um, we're not responsible. This is, in rhetorical terms, um, a masking argument. It's, it's pushing off, uh, shifting responsibility for performance failure, and you see it all the time uh, in rhetorical terms. So in any event, on this, TEPCO, and here's the, the chairman of TEPCO apologizing to the nation, um, became the consensus villain in this narrative, the narrative about risk and vulnerability. Um, as, as, as Colonel Stackpole said, uh, these are the guys who became the heroes, and they used the same word, guy. But for them, the way guy was used, beyond imagination, was that nothing 
is beyond imagination for the Japanese military. They're ready for anything. Hmm? So it's the same term. It's used by different actors spinning up different stories about the same event, um, for, um, but in language that people will respond to um, and, and deal with. Um, so you have the consensus villain, and you have the consensus heroes. As, as Pat said, uh, 100,000 Japanese troops were mobilized in a matter of days. 100,000 is the largest mobilization of the Japanese military since the Pacific War. It's an extraordinary event. And, and they were very successful, and as Pat said, very sensitive. Uh, in their humanitarian assistance and disaster relief activities. Now, importantly, in recent months, uh, there's been a chorus of much more sober evaluations, and this is, this is to Ken Bissler's um, um, remarks, uh, a chorus of more sober evaluations of, about the actual radiation risk um, from, from uh, Fukushima Daiichi. So you have experts uh, like the physicist Dave, David Roberts, who was the, the advisor to Ambassador Roos at the embassy. He's in the State Department's PhD physicist, who are in the current issue of The Atlantic, you should have a look, um, who've argued that Japan's nuclear nightmare, which is with the title with sort of the bait and switch to get you in the room, um, the nuclear nightmare is, is somehow more constructed uh, than, it is, than it is real. Um, if, if it's not exactly under control, um, to, to Ken's point, um, the aspects, you know, the, the most dangerous aspects uh, of the disaster um, seem on their accounts, and I'm not one to judge, uh, but on their accounts, uh, to be less dangerous than most had feared, and certainly uh, less dangerous than the fear-mongering that surrounded uh, the disaster. So there, the, the, that the argument is, and you may have seen um, uh, David Ropik's piece in the New York Times earlier this week, uh, the, the, the greater danger is the, the danger of stress and, and anxiety induced stre uh, stress induced anxiety um, than it is from from radiation, and that um, this is this is a, a matter of real national debate now, um, and it's not at all clear uh, that um, uh, that that the the greater threats and the greater concerns are the ones that are going to continue to dominate uh, that conversation. On the third the third piece of the national dialogue, national discourse, is, is this notion of community. Now this is, social solidarity is, 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 is hardly a new tile in the, uh, the mosaic of, of Japanese national identity. The, the people of Tohoku, the, the northeastern part of Japan where this, where this uh, occurred, were repeatedly applauded uh, for, uh, for their selflessness, for their resolve, uh, for their patient and their persevering nat nature. Um, those of you who speak Japanese know the term gaman zuyoi. Uh, they were willing to accept what had befallen them um, and, and carry on. And as the narrative evolved, this was almost, as I say, to the point of essentialist caricature. Um, but, but as the narrative, uh, narrative evolved, the people of Tohoku suffered, but they suffered together. And um, that, that strong social fabric, and there's lots of evidence that it was extraordinarily strong. Still, that strong social fabric was, was going to enable them to rebuild their communities. So you have the, the term machizukuri, uh, that they would, they, would re, they would rebuild their region, koikizukuri, they would rebuild the nation, kunizukuri. That was a, actually an invented word, um, but you see it in the headlines um, everywhere. So in the dominant narrative uh, about community, the people of Tohoku embodied what it meant to be Japanese. Um, they formed a community and so forth. There were lots of ways to describe this in Japanese, um, and, uh, in the, and all of them showed up in the, in, 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 in the first report by the Japanese Reconstruction Design Council. It was a very important report. It was issued within four months of the catastrophes. Um, they, they issued a report. It was only 39 pages. And in those 39 pages, there were 83 separate references to one word or another having to do with social solidarity. And almost it's a tsunagu, and this one, kizuna, bonds, social bonds. Whoops. This was identified. Well, let me get back to the report. So the report had, had all these uh, 83 references and 39 pages, all of them in bold or italics or in quotes or underlined. And if they had a 3D printer, it would have been raised letters. This is the way people talked about the catastrophe. We're in it together. Gambaro Nippon, right? So there's, there's, um, there's that. Um, the, this here is, this is very interesting. This notion of bonds, every year, a priest in, in a, a, a very major uh, temple in Kyoto, 
announces what the, what the single character, shitomoji, the single character that characterizes the zeitgeist, that's not a Japanese word, the zeitgeist of Japan for the previous year and in 2011, it was social solidarity. And uh, not for no reason. The NGOs were very active. Volunteers were all over the place. Uh, the, so the soldiers were out. Everyone was feeling pretty good about the, the nature and the quality of social solidarity in Japan. And the contrast was repeatedly, distressingly, repeatedly made uh, to uh, Katrina. OK, change. This is probably, the, and this is the fourth and final of the tropes that, that I wanted to get at. But change. Um, was the one that, that, of all of these, these four, was the one that really dominated the national conversation because the everyone wanted to argue that this was the moment that Japan would finally um, depart from its two-decade-long slumber, um, that, the, that, that things would, would, would pick up, that a new chapter would be born. This, this, is, this is particularly nice. We would finally end the post-war. And we would, in, new historiography could be written. We would begin the post-disaster period. A new era uh, was starting. There were windows of opportunity. And you know, these are all actually right out of the, the, uh, the, the national conversation, out of the literature. Um, in fact, I'm guilty. I went to Japan very credulous. I thought, I mean, the working title of my book was going Rebirth of a Nation. With a question mark, that was my exit possibility, but rebirth of a nation because I did think that as most social science theories tell us, you have an equilibrium and it gets punctuated and there's opportunities for all sorts of change. New, new alliances, new political entrepreneurs, new things would happen. Well, not so much. Um, let, me, let me go to the not so much. Um, there were three ways um, across a whole range of, of I'm only going to talk about electric power today, but I looked at security, um, as Pat Stackpole knows, looked at security, and I looked at local government as well. But there were, in each one of those cases, there were basically three ways to describe what needs to be done and what the lessons are from 311. Um, the first is that Japan needs, that, that, that after the catastrophe, the lesson is we've come too far in the wrong direction. We've got to head out in a new direction and fast. That's the first model. It's accelerate. The second is um, that, that uh, this was a bad thing that happened, but we don't want to make too much change because if we make too much change, uh, we're going to throw the baby out with the bathwater and it will be a big mistake. We'll be worse off. It's sort of a rhetoric of reaction if you know, Al, uh, uh, if you know Hirschman. Um, and, and the third model is um, also a model of, uh, of, uh, of change, but a change in which you should go back to the way things were. It was always better in the past. We don't need to go in a new direction. We need to go back to the way things, to the way things were. Um, in the case of electric power um, and energy, those models work out into three, three narratives, which are very identifiable. The first was the notion um, that we have to head off in an entirely new way. This is a nuclear, it's called the nuclear village narrative because the advocates were folks who promoted uh, renewable energy and wanted to see nuclear energy end. Uh, they were anti-nuclear activists and they said the, the, their explanation for 311 was that there was a collusive arrangement between the electric utilities, a, a regulatory system that didn't regulate, um, and academics who were all prostitutes and took all their money from the utilities and just did what the utilities wanted and reported out with the So there's this model that any, any Japanese will tell you they recognize called the nuclear village model. And it was, it was damning of the way that the LDP, the Liberal Democratic Party, had gone about building building an enormous nuclear infrastructure, third, I guess, in the world to the French and the Americans. Um, that narrative um, uh, was the first model. We have to head off in a new direction, solar, wind, uh, geothermal, new. Uh, the second is uh, the, the view of TEPCO, the view of the LDP, the, the, conservative, the conservatives who built the nuclear system, uh, the, the utilities, uh, and large business who said, look, this was a black swan event. It's a one-off. It's not going to happen again for another 1,000 years. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. If we're going to have a, a highly functioning, uh, internationally competitive industrial economy, we have to have nuclear power. And uh, let's, let's stay the course. So it's, a black, it's the black swan narrative. And the third is this, this back to the future uh, group that said, look, 
we have to, you know, we've learned the wrong lessons from the West of the Enlightenment and technology, and we've got to go back to a time before all of that, and, um, and, and life was better and uh, can, be, can be good uh, yet again. If this was a civil, civilizational disaster, and the lesson is it's the end of Western influence in Japan. It's a very interesting argument. Um, the, the real fight, of course, was between one and two. Okay, so in energy policy, what actually happened? And then I'll, then I'll end. Um, in, in energy policy, what, what really changed? Well, a new regulatory structure did come, come into place. The, the nuclear regulatory folks inside the Ministry of, of Economy, Trade, and Industry were taken out of the, the ministry. That ministry was also responsible for promoting nuclear power. And so they, were, they, were, they made the claim, METI did, that they could have their foot on the brake. This is a, a direct quote foot on the brake and the accelerator at the same time. And the Japanese, uh, the government in power at the time, uh, which was not the LDP, and basically the Japanese uh, people said, yeah, well, not so much. And so they needed a new regulatory structure. The new regulatory agency actually seems to have some teeth. And uh, we'll see how that works. So let me just move right through this. The second was a feed-in tariff was put in place, which would fund through higher rates to rate payers, which would, they would earmark those higher, uh, the incrementally higher rates to fund investment in, uh, in uh, alternative energy, particularly renewable energies. Uh, that production would be, which is currently, it's a monopoly system in which the, the TEPCO, for example, has a monopoly on not just the generation of electric power in the capital district, but also its distribution and its transmission, um, that that looks like it, it may be coming to an end. Nukes were dramatically scaled back. Um, in fact, they were all turned off for a long time. Two came back online for a short period, and now they're off again, and nothing's come back on. So that, that's, a, I mean, that's a serious, I don't think that's going to last, but that's a serious change. That's the back online part. What hasn't changed at all was a commitment, a national commitment to the back end of the nuclear fuel cycle. Japan is the only non-nuclear weapons state to have a full spectrum, or at least an effort to create a full spectrum nuclear fuel cycle. And um, that was never touched. It was never, no one ever questioned Rokasha Omura, no, no one ever questioned uh, any of these, these activities. And that, that is a, a source of some concern to many in Japan and elsewhere. Um, and the nuclear export, um, the juggernaut is, is way too hyperbolic, but the, the nuclear, the commitment to using nuclear power exports as central to Japan's new growth strategy was, um, was reinforced through the crisis. The Japanese made, the, the DPJ, the same government that said we're not going to build nuclear plants here at home or we're going to turn off the nuclear power, we're going to cut back, we're saying we're going to sell them abroad. Um, uh, no one, you, I heard giggles here. Uh, th people weren't quite giggling in Japan, I didn't know why. I thought, you know, that this is, a, this is an important thing to pay attention to. And once the LDP um, did return to power in December 2002, it defeated at a time when 80% of the Japanese people said they were opposed to nuclear power. They won. They went back. These are the people who brought the nuclear power system to Japan. I think the Japanese people were exhausted. They didn't trust the government that they had, and they were looking for an alternative. There was one non-nuclear non-nuclear uh, party in play, and they were crushed. Um, and once the LDP was back in power, TEPCO share prices began to rise. Uh, Anti-nuclear members of, of the new energy planning agency uh, were removed. Uh, the fit price was lowered to make it less attractive to invest. Um, and um, interestingly, in the, in the last week, um, this hasn't, I haven't seen this in the Western press, but in the last week, uh, we've begun to see reports on the failures to do safety checks of the, ex the parts and the pieces of the, of the nuclear power plant exports. So it's beginning to, it's beginning to come un unraveled yet again. Okay, final comments, and then I will, I will um, turn it back over uh, uh, to Professor Oi. Um, this is the way I frame the conclusion of the book. It's too early to know exactly what the impact of uh, 311 is going to be. It's, 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 only been a couple, it's, it's only been a couple of years. Um, but there are, it seems to me, two paths. And both of these quotes come from folks I interviewed. The first one from a fellow um, who uh, 
said, look, there are no villains in this story. There's, there's only a dysfunctional system. This is, this is a former uh, a dean of the, Harvard, of the Harvard, Harvard Medical School, of the Tokyo University Medical School. Um, he was given the responsibility to chair, uh, this is Kurokawa Kyoshi, for some of you may know him. Uh, Professor Kurokawa uh, was, was given responsibility to chair the first ever, first ever independent panel um, in the national diet to study the causes of Fukushima Daiichi. It was a very important report. And it was important, he said, because it was going to be open and online and in English in real time. He said, otherwise, they'll crush me. He's not on the left. He's an advisor to Prime Minister Abe. But he didn't believe that he could get it through and pass the bureaucrats unless he, he made this a condition for his accepting the job. And he wants to see a more open, more transparent, more democratic uh, Japanese decision-making process. So that's the first possible path. The second one, on first reading, is jarring. It's very jarring. The notion uh, that this was said to me by a younger um, mid-40s uh, DPJ diet representative. He said, that, look, only 20,000 people died in Tohoku. It just wasn't big enough. Now, I don't know how to theorize a tipping point uh, 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 on this scale. I, I, don't, I don't know anyone who does know how to theorize it. But um, when he said tada ni manin, when he said only 20,000 people, um, I, 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 I sort of jolted my head back. I made him repeat it. He did. Uh, and then I tried it out on my neighbors in Tokyo. And they said, he said that? And I said, yes. Oh, he shouldn't have said that. Hmm, he's right. <laughs> the point being that, 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 that this kind of an idea um, it, it aligns with a really kind of persistent and insistent finding uh, in the work, which is that much of the crisis, the rhetoric, the, much of it alarmist, the, the, the rhetoric um, uh, might amount to little more than empty and self-serving chatter at the, at the end of the day, um, that there is an unpleasant truth about crises in general um, that is worth paying attention to, which is that even citizens who are moved to help one another um, in times of crisis may not be able to sustain their energies um, and their empathy to engage with larger discontents. For example, the next day, I spoke to a, another Diet member. I told him what I was told. And he said, oh, that guy must be from the West. Must be from Western Japan. And I thought, well, how did he know that? In fact, he was. And he says, they don't care. I said, they don't care? Talk to me. So we had this great conversation. But what I was hearing then was, what I was seeing anyway, was the underbelly, a bit of the underbelly uh, of, of this, this thing about social solidarity I told you about, that it doesn't really hold up for everyone all the time, that people do get exhausted, um, and, the, and some of the, the worst, uh, worst prospects are having uh, inflated hopes, inflated hopes for Japan, so, uh, and, and for, for change, I should say. Uh, so let me end with that and, and uh, just remind you that, that we don't know yet what the final accounting is going to look like, uh, what the final impact of, of 311 is going to be. Uh, I can only report that the blame game is very much underway. Um, you get this, this kind of a, of a characterization. Also that this wasn't the first time uh, in Japan uh, that, whoops, oh, I took out that other slide. I had one from 1945, never mind. Um, it's not just in Japan, and this is really important. Uh, I don't want you to leave thinking, I think that the Japanese are all about blaming each other for this catastrophe. We're filled with these kinds of images here from the 1930s and 40s, and here uh, from 9-11, and, and here from someone mentioned the Gulf oil spill. So here we are again. I'll end with that, and thank you very much for your attention. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, we're going to move to uh, question and answer, and we're going to do it Oprah style. Uh, Tom Blackwood, the director of the Japan program, and I have our mics here, and we'll come up to you, and we'd like you to pose your questions to the panel succinctly, quickly, and clearly. Comments? And who wants to cast the first stone in terms of blame? Yeah. Thank you very much. Actually, I learned from the three speakers the unpreparation logistically to address the, such a disaster. From the second speaker, I learned about the magnitude of the problem. And from the third speaker, I learned 
the dysfunctional system as a core of the failures. What I'm going to, what am I going to ask is what's the core of the problem? If he wants to face the real music here, is the, at the core is the failures. We have technical failures, we have uh, decision-making failures, and one is, that's not touched is international failures. Within the technical failures, there was some preparation for tsunami at Japan. This is the reason that the, the, the wall surrounding the, the, the nuclear plant was seven meters high, but unfortunately it should be higher than that. With the uh, decision-making failure, it is, could it be possible that it is because of the hierarchy of decision-making, there is something wrong, the culture of obedience that would not allow the expert and directly re rely on the, the question to the uh, head of the decision making. And in international, in TEPCO and the nuclear facility was under the IAEA supervision. What's the role of IAEA here then? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, why don't we pick up one or two short questions and then we can put our panelists <laughs> on the spot. Uh, Tom, do you want to work this side of the room? Um, yeah. Go ahead. yeah, just to put the economics of the situation in perspective a little bit, I wonder how, how much money has been spent so far to clean up the accident compared to the price to originally build those reactors, and how much more is going to be spent before they're totally decommissioned, do you think? Okay. Other comments and questions? Uh, yes, I'm going to just run up. I'd just like to ask, what kind of narratives do you see arising around the prospect or the challenge of developing the technology that's going to be required to disassemble this thing? So we have a couple questions on cleanup in physical terms and a question on failure in political and cultural terms. Uh, and we'll take one more and then we'll put you guys to the task of answering these tough questions. Uh, was there, yes. About 10 years ago, I joined Karen Polensky on a trip to China to help them figure out uh, emerging environmental regulations. And we had to walk a very fine line between, uh, or helping them understand the value of more regulation or better regulation without causing them to feel bad about their current situation. Can you talk about how helping the Japanese deal with Fukushima um, may fall under similar paradigms? Okay, I think that'll keep you guys busy for a minute or two. Who wants to, to start off? We have a couple questions again on the economic costs and technical feasibility of the cleanups. We had a question on culture, politics, and fixing the system. And we have a question here on, let's call it the sensitivity of responding to international advice or offering international advice where it may or may not be seen as intrusive. Um, you want to go ahead, Ken? Or you want? Yeah, All right, yeah. Well, let me take a, a shot at some of this. Um, I apologize, it'll be a bit random, but I, let me start from the beginning and hopefully keep my path. The first question about logistics and planning um, was, was very interesting. Um, I didn't speak much, I didn't speak at all today about um, one of the most striking developments, I thought, um, in the entire um, post-event um, period, the first two years, which is um, that although there were plans in place, well, this was your question, yeah, there, were, there were plans in place, um, uh, both domestically for fixing what was broken, but also plans in place for the alliance, how we would act in, the, in, in a contingency. Um, at the central government level, they weren't observed. Um, in the case of the alliance, we have um, a bilateral coordination mechanism that was negotiated in 1995, and Pat knows this much better than I do, but in 1995, the two governments got together, said in the event of a contingency, this is the way we're gonna organize ourselves, and we're gonna get 
we're going to have joint commands, and we're going to get stuff done together. Um, the, the Japanese refused to invoke the bilateral coordination mechanism, and it had to be reinvented. And in the process of reinventing it, it took about a week, and there was a lot of loss of time and money uh, to make that happen. That's on the, the but, it, but it, when it worked, it really worked. Uh, it worked very well, the, as, as Pat described. The, the logistics at the local level was probably the most, ex most exciting thing I discovered in the, entire, in the entire project, which is that the local government officials knew the central government wasn't going to be able to respond. It wasn't just not going to be effective. And so immediately began helping each other. And you had this, this, this moment, almost immediately, when um, governors and mayors from all over the country began sending their employees from every functional area, from civil engineers to psychiatrists to school teachers to accountants to payroll officers, got them up to Tohoku to help the people cope at the local level, grassroots. It was an extraordinary thing. And I, I got up to Tohoku for the first time and started doing interviews in a place called Rikuzen Takata in, in, in Iwate Prefecture. And uh, I started asking questions. And the person said, I, I can't answer that. I'm not from here. I'm from Nagoya. Uh, OK. How about you? Can you answer that question? Oh, I'm, I'm from Yokohama. Oh. How about you? I'm from Hyogo Prefect. Oh, you know, is anyone here from Rikuzen Takada? Now, you know, it was very interesting. So I, then I started talking to governors and mayors. Um, why were you doing this? It's just you know, altruism. Uh, as a political sci card carrying political scientist, I know there's no such thing. So you know. um, I wanted to hear their answer. And the answer was fascinating. It was, well, the next disaster is going to be ours. And I want people trained in disaster relief and humanity. I want people who know their way around the block when the disaster hits. And that's why I sent my people up there. And we're also doing good. But so in terms of planning, um, this was not exactly planned, but an extremely pragmatic and very effective and, uh, way to set in motion plans for, for the future. High marks for that. Um, on this issue of um, culture of obedience and, 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 and so forth. I, I, it's not a phrase I'd, I'd use, uh, to be honest, culture of obedience. Um, you had a, a very active uh, anti-nuclear movement that sprung up. Now, it took a while. It took a while. Um, they really didn't start getting traction uh, until uh, a, about a year later. Uh, after the catastrophe. But once they did, you're talking about demonstrations of hundreds of thousands uh, to millions of people, uh, and at a time when they were debating their options uh, for the future of nuclear power, and forced the government to back down from, from some of the more expansive ideas about how large the nuclear, uh, nuclear capability should be. Um, so there's that. I, I, don't, I don't think of Japan as hierarchical and you know, obedience. And I, that's not, I don't think, an effective way to think about the politics uh, or the economics of the situation. Fin a third, maybe finally for me, um, is, is this issue of the cost of nuclear power. That was maybe the last question, but it's a really good question. For years, the quote unquote nuclear village, and I'm giving you the ironic quotes because it is a narrative. It's not my narrative. It is a narrative, and it's an important one. The people who said that the nuclear village was determining how Japan worked were constantly saying, look, the real costs of nuclear power are being understated by orders, maybe an order of magnitude. And so what was that order of magnitude? They were talking about 4 yen per kilowatt hour as, as the cost of nuclear power. Well, suddenly, after this crisis, it was 18. And some said it should be 30-something. Um, and that because they hadn't formally incorporated the cleanup costs, but even that, they hadn't formally incorporated the decommissioning costs of the plants, which should have been in there without regard for whether or not there was an accident. So this issue of the real cost of nuclear power is very important. And uh, I, don't, I don't have a figure for a bottom line what's going to be spent, but um, I'm not sure I have enough zeros on my machine to, to be able to calculate it. Ken? Yeah, I was uh, thinking on that last point, too, about the cleanup proposals, the ice dam, $400 million. I don't have a total, but one item to contain the groundwater from reaching these reactors. And it, it seems like there's a, a lot of controversy, a lot of <coughs> misinformation about what the effect of that might be, how effective it would be. We're seeing they can't even keep you know, power on some of the cooling ponds. How could they do something on this scale that's never been done before? But there's another level of this that's 
to trust that the solutions that people will accept them. And the example I was told by some frustrated TEPCO people were, you know, they can't even take clean water and put it in the ocean anymore. And they're going to have a thousand tanks of radioactive water that will still have residual isotopes in them. And they're going to have to have built up the trust that they'll say, this is something we will either accept or be told they will have to accept. I just don't see how the trust is moving hand in hand with the engineering. We're hearing about the money that's being spent on engineering, and I'm seeing very little that's really happening to rebuild that trust. And I can't put a cost on that, but I would say those, if they don't happen in equal measures, we might have the best engineering solution someday. We're not there yet. And still not have the ability to deal with the problem at hand, which is the soil uh, that's contaminated the 80,000 people when they can move back to their homes and all of this water. And so, you know, maybe we should put a cost on that and add that in. Uh, the other, only other thing I really want to talk early on is just talking about the, the, some of the failures, maybe the first three uh, questions and, you know, the science failure. And what I've kind of discovered on the academic side is when we went to say, offer our service, we wanted to go and help out, that we didn't have an agency in this country that really had an interest. NOAA was given our National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration uh, kind of the authority to look at this disaster and see what the US response should be. Uh, their reaction was to continue this modeling effort to try and model where these things might be at, not to do <coughs> the on the ground field efforts. They said, we don't do that. We don't measure radionuclides. And then they'd point across the aisle to a Department of Energy, who was our body that looks at radioactive waste, spills on land, contamination from reactor sites and our uh, nuclear facilities. They will study and have expertise on this up to the point it reaches the ocean. And then that's not their thing. It's salty. That's not their problem. So here we have in our country, in a in particular, and many reactors on oceans, and don't have even an authority or body that has a mission that includes fate of those radionuclides in the oceans. And I think that's a failure that uh, we still haven't solved. We've come in a little bit closer. We're talking to these people, realize the need for this. It's very obvious when you hear the stories about leaking tanks on land getting into the ocean. There's a connection there. But we've failed to kind of fill that in our ability to understand the consequences. So it might not be what you're looking for, but one example of something we're still trying to plug up as a failure. And there's one last question on the, f on the table for Pat. And it's the question on foreign assistance, advice, or even measurement, and how it can be done in a manner that doesn't seem too arrogant. Okay. And yeah. you were sitting there as we were doing our measurements and offering our advice. Do you have any advice on this issue with benefit of hindsight? Sure. I, you know, I think first, uh, every time we talk the blame game, it's really um, the magnitude, the enormity of this disaster is really stunning. You know, I mean, every road is gone. Every road is blocked. All the fuel's contaminated. You know, trucks are washed away. The trucks you're going to use to to clear stuff, okay? Um, your family, you don't know where they are. Your home is gone, and you're supposed to work there, and you're working at this nuclear plant. I mean, all of these things were just uh, just one thing after another was was just a, an enormous problem on top of another enormous problem. You know, the, the plants actually worked pretty good. I mean, you know, they, they, they shut down the reaction, but there was a lot of residual heat. They lost power, and they couldn't get rid of the heat. And, uh, you know, you could, in 2020 hindsight, hey, you should have had redundant on top of redundant power on top of redundant power. But nobody expected 200 miles and seven clicks in, everything being, being messed up. And, uh, and that's just an enormous problem. Yes, they can look back, and, and they are fixing some of those, as, as I remember back then, that they were looking at additional generation power, because that was the deal, was to make sure those spent fuel pools stayed cool, and that you got the residual heat out of the reactors when, when they went down. But I mean, it's a General Electric reactor, the same one that's up in uh, Yankee in Vermont. So it's, it's the same reactor, and you know they have been uh, relatively robust. And, and, and it worked as was supposed to, except for, you know, no one expected all the other problems on top of that. Um, then there was the cultural issue of, you know, who's telling what to who and, and uh, you know, a private company, are they going to be as forthcoming? And that was just very hard to work through. It was a technical, you know, there was technical uh, differences of opinion. 
And, um, you know, frankly, uh, the water was one of them. I think if the, I remember the guys that, that run these plants in the United States, if the same thing happened, they'd just dump water on it. Well, the Japanese don't want to dump water for all the reasons we just talked about, you know? And so there's a technical difference, difference of opinion. There's a cultural difference of opinion. And uh, to get to Ken's point, you know, everybody and his brother was telling the Japanese what to do at that point, you know? And, and they had a lot, of, you know, a lot of technical expertise. Uh, the Japanese could have been a little bit arrogant about it because, you know, especially the U.S. Navy, we have a lot of technical nuclear expertise. And, and you know, so there was a little uh, uh, back and forth there that I think the Japanese could have been more forth or been received a little bit better. And I think the, the, the world could, you know, it's a first world country that, that has a lot of nuclear capability and they can take care of it themselves. To get to humanitarian assistance, I've been involved in a lot of humanitarian assistance. I've never been involved in one where it was a first world country with a lot of capability and a lot of their own money. Usually going to some place like Haiti where you, you do whatever you need to do in order to get done. In Japan, we had to go through, you know, basically the, the local governments and the central government to the local government. To be even, even able to spend money, we had to get a request from the uh, central government through the embassy for us to use, uh, to use our money. And that was, that was a hassle, and that slowed a lot of things down. Uh, we started spending money pretty quick, though. We went through $100 million. They gave us $100 million. We burned through that in about three weeks. And uh, so, <laughs> you know, the enormity of cleaning this thing, I don't think we can calculate that. You know, it's like going to Cambridge and draw a 20-kilometer circle and say, what's it cost to relocate everybody? Or Tyson Corner in Virginia. I mean, it's just massive amounts of people that they're going to have to relocate. So, so what anyway. remains is actually a couple quick items. First, in the back of the room, uh, we do have copies of Oceanus, and Ken has very kindly brought up copies of this. Uh, you're welcome to take a copy without paying $100 million for them. <laughs> Second, I'd very much like to thank the panelists for their presentations, for taking the time to come and to speak with insight, authority, and I just wish the answers were simpler to the questions that were being posed. And finally, I'd like to thank the sponsors. And we really have or owe a debt of thanks to the Center for International Studies, to the Japanese American Citizens League, to the Japan program, and Tom for helping set this up. But thank you all for what has been, again, a 90 minutes that only really begins on the problems and the questions. We actually obviously could have gone on for hours on these topics. The panelists will be around for 10 or 15 minutes after. And thank you for your attention. Yeah.